So Carlos, are you ready? Ready to go. All right, so we are very pleased to have Carlos Simpson from Université Côte d'Azur, who will tell us about moduli spaces of shoes on surfaces. He'll give us, uh, he was very generous to agree to give four lectures and his first lecture is entitled Moduli Spaces of Sheaves and Overview of the Geography. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Izet, for, uh, for the invitation to give a, a lecture, small lecture series. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about in general is moduli spaces of sheaves on surfaces, but more precisely, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so here's the schedule of the four talks. So I gave a subtitle to each talk. Uh, the hope is to fit, fit those four talks into the four 50 minute time periods. Uh, that might possibly be modulated slightly, but I think it should be okay. Uh, okay, so the so I'd like to, in these talks, I'd like to give uh, talks about work, uh, work with Nicole Mastrano on kind of an explicit description of at least some aspects of the moduli spaces of sheaves on a quintic hypersurface in P3. Uh, before, what we'll do today is before getting to that, I'll give some general remarks about moduli of, of bundles on surfaces and other related things. Okay, so um, this was a project which we sort of started in around 2007, 2008 maybe, uh, and went, over, went along for several years. And we had the input of many people, uh, uh, have written down here, uh, Yoshioka, Hirschowitz, uh, Charles Walter, uh, Masahiko Saito, Kangsuo, Adrian Longer, and Sarbaswar Paul, among other people who we talked with a lot. Um, and this, this also has a lot of contributions from all the people you know, who were uh, the, the, big, uh, the big names in theory of moduli spaces, um, particularly Kieran uh, O'Grady, as I think we'll, you'll see in the course of the talks. Um, and of course, the, all the great names, as we'll see. Uh, so uh, we'd like to thank the Institute of Advanced Study where we, were, where we currently are for another three weeks, I guess. Uh, so we're doing the, preparing the talks. The, the work was done in, in Nissan, basically. Uh, okay. So let me also just make a remark. So I tried to include a few references to maybe not actual papers, but authors at least, uh, for various different directions and subjects and stuff like that. Um, this can't really be exhaustive in any way, so I think you guys all understand. Um, you, you, you're all many of contributors of the, of the theory, uh, among other things. Um, so let me just not, just, let's just say this is really not a, any kind of attempt to be exhaustive in any way. Um, and we did try to do that in our paper moduli of sheaves, but that was already, had a ton of references and that was several years ago. Um, and since then there's been a ton more references and also even at the time that wasn't complete either. So uh, it's, it's difficult as, as you understand to like write down everything that everybody knows in the theory obviously, which is a good, which is a good thing. Um, okay, so the first talk is about an overview of the geography for moduli spaces of sheep. Um, so we'll, we'll start by looking at sort of globally at you know, recalling some basic facts about uh, properties of moduli spaces of bundles. Uh, and then we'll, then we'll introduce the problem that we're working on specifically here, uh, which is rank two bundles on hypersurfaces of degree five. So just the basic definitions, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure 95% of you guys know this all extremely well, but anyway, let me just start. The, the, suppose we have a smooth reductive surface. Well, this could be a, a variety of any dimension, but, uh, Today will be, I mean, today and tomorrow will be mostly concerned with a surface. So suppose we have a surface, then we have a hyperplane plane class H. Uh, then the degree, if we have a torsion free sheaf, then its degree is the first turn class dotted with the hyperplane class. And the slope is the degree divided by the rank. Uh, and then we say it's stable if for any strictly non trivial subsheaf, uh, the slope of the subsheaf is strictly smaller than the slope of E or semi-stable if it's less than or equal to. And as I think you all know, uh, we can profitably replace slope semi-stability or slope stability by Giesecker of semi-stability or Giesecker of stability. And that's important to do the moduli theory. Um, whereas somehow the slopes, the slope stability or semi-stability is more related to, to 
metric questions like Hermit Einstein metrics. Um, luckily for what we're going to be talking about today, that there's not really any difference. Um, okay. So the, the main theorem of the subject is that there is a moduli space. So I would like, can you guys, I think you guys can see my little cursor here, right? Uh, so I'd like to note this by M bar with a little TF there. That means torsion free sheaves. Um, depending on the turn invariant, so here we'll write the rank, the C1, the C2, depends on X. I should also put an H in there somewhere because it depends on the, on the hyperplane class that we're using to measure stability. Um, anyway, it's a course, and we get a course moduli space of Giesecker semi-stable torsion free sheaves with the turn invariance. Course moduli space, of course, means that it's uh, it classifies objects up to S equivalents, S for Sashadri, um, basically. Uh, yeah, so that's the basic construction. That, this was done by Mumford for curves and then by numerous people, starting with Yizekur and Maoyama. And then I put Adrian Longer here also because he did the generalization in, in kind of pretty full generality to characteristic P. Um, I think other people also have major contributions there. Um, and so we can also, let me just mention that we can also extend this to a, a construction of moduli of pure sheaves supported in some dimension, uh, which was first introduced by Mukai for, for the category of the, the moduli space of simple sheaves, maybe on a K3 surface, I think. Um, now, a main tool here, especially on, in higher dimensions, or well, even for curves, obviously, uh, is deformation and obstruction theory. We'll be just discussing that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but let's just say that if we take a K3 surface or an abelian surface, then the canonical sheet is, is trivial. So Sarah duality tells us that the obstruction theory, the deformation and obstruction theory is dual to itself. So that on a surface, the, H, the H1 is dual to H1 and the H2 is dual to H0. If you have a stable sheaf, then the H, the the, the trace free part of the H zero is, is vanishes. And so that tells us that the space of obstruction vanishes. Um, the obstructions are in the trace free part. So in that case, it means that the moduli space is automatically smooth. And the, the duality between H one and itself gives you a, a, a pairing on the tangent space and you get a symplectic form that way. So this is a case that has been studied a lot. Uh, Maybe the most, probably not the most recent, but some recent, relatively recent papers were by, by Yoshioka, uh, pretty much describing the situation pretty fully, I think. Uh, that, that was originally looked at by Mukai, I think, who was the first person to, to focus on this case. Um, then other people have also contributed a lot. Uh, let me just mention here that uh, the, the, the case of K3 services is a major case for the study of Brill Noether theory. So what does that mean? It means the study of not just moduli spaces of sheaves, but moduli spaces of sheaves where you have some lower bound, you're, you fix a lower bound on the dimension of, the, of some H0 or, or other cohomology space. Uh, so that's looking at some kind of real notes or loci inside the moduli, the big moduli space. Um, so that a, lot have been, a lot has been done for K3 surfaces and more recently for other surfaces too. Uh, and I just noticed, I put this here uh, just this morning. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, there was a preprint this morning by Bhattacharya about that very subject. So if you like to look up archive. Um, the, then of course, if we go in the direction of KX being negative, then, well, you get sort of to rational surfaces, rational or ruled surfaces, maybe also elliptic surfaces. Um, and in the case of rational surfaces, such as, for example, P2 to start with. Um, the moduli spaces have been studied. Uh -huh. uh, OK, so you just want to date that the funds left. Carlos, you're mute. That can you unmute yourself. Is that good? Can you hear me? I can't hear you, is it? But anyway. <laughs> now nah, we can yes, hear you. Yes, you're good. Yep. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the case of P2, bundles on P2 has been studied intensively in many ways. Um, theories I can't say that I understand very well, but the, there's things called monads and hel helices and stuff like that, which are really algebraic descriptions 
Um, I think we could conceptualize this a little bit by saying that, you know, Valenson gives a semi-exceptional, it gives a, a, a decomposition, a, a semi-orthogonal decomposition uh, for the drug category of, of projective space. And in some sense, I think that these specialized techniques could probably be viewed, I don't know if people have looked at that precisely, but I think these specialized techniques could probably be viewed in some way as kind of applying that semi-orthogonal decomposition to the actual study of moduli spaces. Um, but of course, there's more precise, there's more concrete ways of viewing that. So uh, the kind of the motivation for our project is that we like to go in the opposite direction. So instead of taking Kx to be negative, to go in the direction of Kx being positive, uh, and that's the case of surfaces of general type. And so, well, if we uh, if we take a surface of degree four and you know, hypersurface of degree four, and I, mean, I guess a surface of degree four in P three, then that's a K three surface, right? The canonical bundle is trivial as Ox. If we take degree less than or equal to three, you have a rational surface. So going in the general type direction is taking just a slightly higher degree, and the first possibility is degree five. So that, that's the reason for the choice of degree rule five, basically. Um, the case of hypersurface of degree five is particular, has a lot of nice properties uh, with respect to simplifying some of the you know, more complicated technical aspects. So for example, um, the canonical sheaf is OX of one. Um, and you know, there, there really isn't anything between OX of one and OX of zero. So, uh, that makes it kind of easy to, under, to understand semi-stability or stability of, of bundles, basically. Um, but nonetheless, the hypersurfaces of degree thing, five are, are general type. So this is, you might say, I, I maybe hesitate to say exactly the first case of general type, but it's one of the first cases of surfaces of general type. Um, there, are, are, there are obviously other case examples of surfaces of general type with the canonical sheet being small in some sense. Um, which I think it would be worthwhile to look at also, but this is the case we looked at. Um, okay, so let's uh, discuss, in, just in the vein of the general discussion, uh, let's just go back and comment on a much more general, uh, on a much more basic case. You, you know, the, the original case was the case of sheaves on curves, bundles on curves. Uh, this started with the work of Narasimhan Sashadri, uh, both unfortunately not now with us anymore. Um, so that's kind of sad. Uh, so Narasimha and Sachadri, as you'll recall, showed that the, that the moduli space of stable bundles was going to be equivalent to the moduli space of unitary representations of the fundamental group. And this led to a, a, a much later to Donaldson theory, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then also Turin uh, looked also at this theory around the same time. And uh, Turin and Narasimha and Ramanan gave explicit descriptions of the moduli spaces for curves of genus two. Uh, that's something I'm currently working on with uh, Janagi and Pontev for other reasons. Um, but it's, it's quite explicit algebraic geometry and it's really the, the last chapter of Griffiths and Harris basically. So there's something called the quadric line complex. Uh, the two moduli spaces of odd and even degree of rank two bundles on genus two curves, those are the even degree is P3 and the odd the odd case is a intersection of two quadrics in P5. Um, so there's a there's kind of a lot of special geometry that happens uh, in that particular case, which is very nice. Uh, and then you know some aspects of that situation were generalized to other higher things. So for example, the case of higher hyper elliptic curves in a gene, bigger genus was done by Desawa Ramana. Uh, Then now, of course, since then we have a much fuller understanding of any aspects of the theory. But I don't think I'm not sure to what extent we really have you know a moduli space you can actually write down in quite such an explicit way. Uh, okay, now another 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 interesting topic in the case of moduli space of bundles on a curve is, is that if M is the moduli space of bundles, then we can take L. This script L is the determinant line bundle and take its tensor powers, its ample. Look at spaces of sections, and these are uh, spaces. These are vector spaces whose dimension is given by the famous Verlinda formula. And we can, in mathematical physics terms, these these vector spaces are also called spaces of conformal blocks. So that's a, been a gigantic study, subject of study. There's the vice zumino witten connection and Hitchin connection. Um, so as we let, so this depends on the the, the curve x. 
on this page, X is a curve, not a surface, obviously. This depends on the curve X. And as we move X around in the moduli space of curves, you've got a, these vector spaces form a bundle that has a connection, has a projectively flat connection, uh, which enters into quantum field, uh, conformal field theory. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, kind of one general theme is that uh, whenever you have stuff you can say about moduli of bundles on curves, then you could look at what in what way that can uh, tell you some kind of question, at least for higher dimensions. And so the, the Verlinda formula is an example of this in the sense that, um, that the Verlinda formula tells you that there's a, a rank level of duality. There's some kind of duality between the Verlinda spaces for a bundle of a given rank and for a given power of k. The level k here, that was the tensor power of L. There's a duality between the Verlinda space for r comma k and for k comma r. Um, called rank level duality or strange duality. And that, that thing had a, a, a version of that for higher dimensions. So for example, for coherent systems or for bundles on P2 uh, that was studied by Lepochi, uh, so I, I'm, I'm just, I not want to say, don't want to say anything about that here, but just to point out that in general, if you have some kind of as interesting aspect of for moduli spaces of curves, uh, vector bundles on curves, you can also look at how that might generalize in higher dimension. Okay, now back to the case of a higher dimensional variety X. So the main, the you know, the as again, I'm sure you guys all know, uh, the the main new phenomenon that's happening, which was not visible on curves, is the bogomol gieseker inequality. And the best way of writing this down is to introduce something called the delta invariant. Uh, the reason is that uh, if we take a bundle, we can always tensor with a line bundle. That's going to change its churn invariance. So it, we can make an invariant which is stable under tensoring with a line bundle called delta. And if I didn't make a mistake of the formula, it's C2 of E minus R minus 1 over 2R, C1 of E squared. And that's supposed to be the, it's supposed to be whatever formula it is that has a C2 in it that has the property that when you tensor with a line bundle, it stays the same. And then the, the Bogomol Gieseker inequality can be phrased in terms of delta by saying that if you have a slope semi stable torsion free sheet, then delta is positive. And equality, if and only if it's actually a bundle and carries a projectively flat unitary connection. So I think, I hope my attributions here are roughly correct. So the, the, the inequality was due to both Bogomol and then Gieseker. Um, the, the part about the connection is due to, and plus, you know, a, new, a, a differential geometric proof plus the part about a connection is due to Donaldson, at least in the case of surfaces. And then Mita Romanathan proved uh, a, restriction, a, a restriction theorem. So saying that if you have a higher dimensional variety that's stable sheaves or semi stable sheaves, restrict to semi stable or stable sheaves on, on hyperplane sections in an appropriate way. And that, that's actually sufficient to allow you to get the statement. Uh, in higher dimension. So Donaldson theory on surfaces plus Maton on Anathan's argument gives you this statement. Now, what's Donaldson's theory? So as I said before, Donaldson's theory stemmed really from Narasimha and Sushadri uh, in, the, in the strong sense that Donaldson's first paper was, you know, a, called a new proof of the theorem of Narasimha and Sushadri. Maybe not his first paper, his like first paper in the series of papers about uh, special metrics on bundles, it's a complex bundle. Um, so giving a new, giving a new uh, gauge theory proof of Narasimha and Sushadri's theorem, that was one of the motivations, you might say, I guess, for the general theory in higher dimensions. And so, um, well, so Donaldson's theory of special metrics on complex bundles, it was kind of a, I mean, I wouldn't say a sidelight, it was, it was a kind of a partner theory that went along with his gauge theory for differential manifolds. Um, and so Donaldson shows that if we have a, a Hermitian, I, well, I mean, just the general construction is if we have a Hermitian metric on a bundle, then there's a unique unitary connection that's compatible with the whole Hermitian structure. So of course, that's not necessarily going to have a vanishing curvature. And then we can make the following condition called Hermitian Einstein if the, I mean, this is, it's basically the, the, the wedge product of F with the Kähler form that we can talk about it using lambda. Lambda is the adjoint of the Kähler operator. 
So if lambda times f, you know, f is the two form with values and, and the morphism of the bundle, and lambda takes the two down to a zero. So, so lambda times f is a scalar section of bundle and morphism. And Hermitian Einstein says lambda times f should be an appropriate constant times the, the identity matrix. And what we're saying here, we will give, we should of course give a Kähler metric on X, which is, should be in the class of the hyperplane section that we're using to measure stability. Then so Donaldson's theorem is if we have a slope stable bundle, then it emits a, a Hermitian Einstein metric, which is, is easy to see as unique up to a scalar. And I, I might be saying something slightly wrong here, but I wanted to just make a shortcut uh, there. Uh, so basically the formula, a Bachner type formula for integration of the, of the curvature tells you that um, the, the delta invariant is greater than or equal to zero. And if the delta invariant equals zero, then the curvature is a scalar two form. Uh, you might need to do some tricks by concerning with a line bundle or possibly even a, some kind of virtual parabolic type line bundle or something like that. But uh, roughly speaking, uh, that's, that, that's maybe the easiest to state version of the statement. Um, okay, then this was also proven by Yulin by Yao in the case of higher dimensional varieties. And then Donaldson ha also, I think, sort of after Yulin by Yao, or at least independently, had another, uh, his, his paper about um, determinants and special metrics, um, also gave a, a proof of this in higher dimensions. And then what was the motivation for, the, for doing this? Well, it was to use complex vector bundles, moduli spaces in order to study the, the, the Donaldson invariants for differential geometric manifolds. Um, I'm not sure if Donaldson really himself, uh, maybe somebody can point this out, did really gave an actual theorem in the sense uh, uh, doing that because this has been a subject of great, a great deal of study ever since then basically. Uh, but the basic idea was to use the, the complex vector bundle moduli spaces as a way of getting at the uh, at the Donaldson invariants for differential geometric manifolds. But so remember that the Donaldson invariants were defined using a gauge equation, the anti-self dual metric equation, which is analogous, if not even basically equivalent to the Hermitian Einstein um, equation for, for metrics. I mean, I guess the combination of Hermitian Einstein plus the integrability del bar squared equals zero equation for the complex moduli spaces. Uh, but one of the, you know one of the points here is that in the in the gauge theory equation, one makes some kind of hypothesis about genericity of the metric, or maybe even genericity of some deformation of the of the uh, anti-self dual equations in such a way that the that you get a, a smooth moduli space that would be needed in order to calculate the, the gauge theory invariance. But of course, the complex moduli spaces are, are almost never smooth. I, I mean, we saw an example in the case of K3 surfaces, I guess. But other than that type of thing, they're almost never going to be smooth, in fact. Um, so, so it's actually a question to, to what extent can we really give a precise relationship between the Donaldson variance and the corresponding invariance that you could define using the complex moduli spaces. Um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's a, still a big subject of study, I guess. Uh, maybe has seen possibly a little bit of a hiatus in the meantime, but uh, I think people are still working on that question, basically. But I don't think we can say we know, fully speaking, how, how this exactly plays out. And please, if somebody wants to correct me, <laughs> please feel free. Um, I, there's probably things I don't know through all that. Um, but in, in, in any case, uh, this mode, it, I mean, this is a pretty clear motivation in any case for the study of the complex moduli spaces of vector bundles, and also motivates the idea that we would like to, at least in some kind of good cases, have some a result saying that they're like as smooth as possible, basically. Um, so the basic idea is to say that for large values of C2, so that's the invariant, uh, we can see from the Bogomolo-Giesiger inequality that C2 we should think of it as getting bigger because if it gets becomes negative, you know, if the delta invariant becomes negative, so that's the C2 in the case where it's C1 equals zero. If the delta invariant becomes negative, then the, the moduli space is empty. So uh, not too much is happening. Um, so you can think of having large values of C2 as being uh, 
the case where you expect some kind of general sort of behavior to be happening. Uh, and so the expe expectation is that for large values of C2, these spaces should be as close as possible to the gauge theoretic moduli spaces. Uh, so a, a main type of theorem, this, and this was started off pretty much at the same, you know, concomitantly of, with Donaldson theory, was to show that the moduli spaces should have the expected dimension, for example, that should be generically smooth and should be irreducible. Uh, and we, you would, of course, like to have a bound on the co-dimension of the singular locus. I should say maybe, sorry, a lower bound of the co-dimension, but yeah, upper bound on the dimension of the singular locus. Um, OK, so this was uh, done. Uh, I'm probably forgetting some people here, so I'll, let me apologize. But basically, Donaldson, Friedman, uh, then Giesecker and Lee, and uh, uh, Zuo, I think, also had a paper on and O'Grady. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that pretty much uh, uh, the optimal theoretical bound was obtained by, by O'Grady. Um, but you know the original bounds and, and treatment of some cases were, were Donaldson Friedman. Um, so the statement is that if there's a bound, we can give a computable bound. So the, the, nation, the notion that this is a computable bound that's given in O'Grady's papers, um, I mean, not just in the sense of abstract computability, but I mean, O'Grady actually gives a way of getting a formula for, for C. Um, as well, and part of the, the work we're doing here is that you know O'Grady's formula is a, is a general thing in a general setting, so uh, we can hope that in some specific case, like our case of quintic hypercircuits, we might be able to improve that bound. But uh, but as a general matter, uh, O'Grady gives a, a formula which is you know roughly speaking optimal. Um, so it's a bound C depending on the the variety, the hyperplane class, the rank, and the and the degree of the bundle. Such that for C2 bigger than the constant, then the moduli space is good. So good is a technical term here, which means generically smooth of the expected dimension. Something could be generically smooth, but not necessarily good. They could also have the expected dimension, but not necessarily be good. Um, good means both of those together. And it's also irreducible. The, the bound for irreducible is higher than the bound for good. Uh, but anyway, so okay, so so we know this. So so the conclusion is that for large values of C two, we know roughly speaking what's happening. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have a completely perfect control over, for example, the size of the singular locus and stuff like that. Uh, so that's still, I think, a, maybe a question to be studied. Uh, but roughly speaking, we can say we, in terms of overall properties of the moduli space, we know what's happening for for large values of C two. Let me just make a few more comments about research direction. So uh, another research direction has been the study of uh, sheaves on threefolds in, uh, in higher dimensions, threefold and, and, and fourfold and stuff like that. Uh, a, a common topic in this type of study is the study of arithmetically Cohen Macaulay sheaves. Um, I think this was actually, sorry, I'm sorry, this is a slight mistake. Uh, This is a related, so I'm sorry, this is a related definition. I think arithmetic, arithmetic Cohen Macaulay means that, that H1 up through Hn minus one vanish for all the twists, uh, which is roughly speaking the same thing as this definition here, which was actually what we were calling semi natural cohomology. So I'm sorry, this is not quite right. Anyway, uh, roughly speaking, you're correct. Um, and that's the, anyway, that study has been generated lots of results in uh, for varieties of dimension three and four, for example. Well, now if you have a suppose you have a rank two bundle, and suppose you have a, some sec, like a section of your rank two bundle, then the zero set of that section is going to be a co-dimension two in general, a co-dimension two subvariety. So if you have if you're setting, for example, a rank two bundle on a threefold, then a section of that bundle would give you a curve in the threefold. Okay, so uh, we'll see we'll see what's called the Sarah construction for for surfaces that zero set is going to be a, a collection of points. Um, but in, in higher dimensions, that's going to be a, a higher dimensional uh, subscheme. And so th this is maybe one explanation for why it's generally speaking more difficult to study um, bundles on higher dimension, on varieties of dimension of three and more, is because we have hard terms conjecture, which I'm not stating here, but uh, some of you may know the statement, uh, hard terms conjecture about the possibility for having um, uh, smooth curves inside a, you know, sorry, smooth sub varieties of, say, co-dimension two or some smaller co-dimension inside a higher dimensional variety. 
uh, roughly speaking, says that maybe for varieties we mentioned five or more, we won't really expect to have too many co-dimension two subvarieties, something like smooth co-dimension two subvarieties. So that's the, that just illustrates the type of difficulty that's going to be showing up in addition to just the usual bundle difficulties that we're getting for surfaces. So I think I would just classify this as generally speaking a difficult subject uh, bundle on varieties with dimension bigger than or equal to three. Uh, let me just also comment on just running through some of the possible things we can say here about research directions. So uh, Bridgeland, Tom Bridgeland introduced a general notion of stability condition on a derived category. Uh, and this is kind of generalizing slope stability. Uh, however, uh, it's not really very well known how to construct examples of stability conditions on variety of dimension bigger than or equal to three. And even for surfaces, it's difficult also. And this has led to a new direction, which is other kinds of Bogomo of Giesecker type inequalities uh, that were introduced by Bayer, Macri, and Toda, uh, who, who gave a conjecture. Uh, and then the conjecture was proved by Macri, Schmidt, uh, uh, Bayer, Macri, Stellare, Lee, Bayer, Lahoz, Macri, Stellare, and other people in some, in some cases. Uh, and that conjecture allows you to create a Bridgeland st stability condition using a kind of exotic Bogomol Giesecker inequality. And why I would say exotic, exotic is because it's an inequality involving C3. And I guess we kind of expect there should be some kind of inequalities in, involving higher term classes also. Then let's also comment that there's a phenomenon of wall crossing. So there's going to be parameters determining the stability condition. So here we fixed the, our hyperplane class H. In our case, uh, the Picard group is just going to have rank one. So there's not much of a choice there. But uh, in general, if the, if the narrow and severity group has a positive, has a, a rank two or more, then there's going to be a Kähler cone. And inside that Kähler cone, the rational points of that Kähler cone will, will all be possible. Uh, hyperplane classes that you could use to define stability. And typically the stability depending on one class is not necessarily the same as stability depending on a different class. When, when the parameter crosses a wall, there, there's a, the, the space of, kind of, of uh, parameters is divided up into chambers by some walls. When the parameter crosses a wall, then there's some kind of typically birational transformation of the moduli space. And so that's a big subject of study also. Um, Okay, so now let's go back to our, the motivation for our research project that we'll be discussing here. So we'd like to look at bundles on surfaces. So as we've seen, the structure is known, uh, well, if Kx is trivial, the structure is known for all values. Uh, as we were saying, for rational surfaces, it's oh, many things are known. There's also questions. Uh, so let me mention uh, Izet and Koskuna and Huizenga's papers, for example, many recent papers. Um, Giving, giving, for example, existence criteria and other things. Uh, there was a case of del, del, existence of stable bundles on del Pezzo surfaces by Levine. Uh, there has been a certain number of studies of the case of elliptic surfaces. So uh, Friedman's original papers were about elliptic surfaces. Then I think, roughly speaking, maybe there weren't too many papers in the intervening time about elliptic surfaces. But, but re more recently, there have been, uh, uh, again, more papers by Yamada, Yoshioka, and other people. Um, then, as we were saying, so for if we go to surfaces of general type, then for large values of C2, we have a good structure theory. And so the question we like to understand is what happens for intermediate values of C2 between C2 equals zero, basically, for the Bogomol Giesecker inequality and these large values of C2. There's something that's going to be happening inside there. And this should, generally speaking, fall under uh, uh, Vakil's Murphy law principle, saying that. Anything, pretty much anything can probably happen. Um, so we, we had examples of different phenomena. So you can get non-reduced moduli spaces. You can get moduli spaces that have several irreducible components. Um, you can get, so um, Kutzkun, Huizinga, Kupfer, for example, have recently given examples of disconnected moduli spaces. And in fact, moduli spaces were, I mean, in general, you have examples where moduli spaces can have kind of arbitrarily many uh, irreducible components or connected components. So the work we're going to discuss today is we'd like to understand the try to, to get a full picture for all the values of C2 of the of the moduli theory spaces. Now I say a picture, what I mean by picture really is kind of like the global properties, just is it what's the dimension? Is, is it generically smooth and uh, or, or or generically non-reduced? And is it irreducible? Um, 
And we're going to be looking at the case of hypersurfaces of degree five in P3. Um, so we call it the, in the KX trivial case, that's degree four. Uh, we already had strong results saying that it was always good and always irreducible and stuff like that. Uh, and so, I mean, part of the basic conclusion is that some of those results can sort of still sort of leak over into the into the general type uh, uh, situation. Uh, for degree six, we already have an example that says you have a moduli space that's reducible that has at least two areas of components. So let me just uh, start giving the general setup and notations that we'll use uh, throughout the, the rest of the lecture. So, so these are notations that will be in effect up until at least the very last part where we'll discuss the degree six case. But uh, up until then, we'll have x inside P3 is going to be a, a very general hypersurface of degree five. And one of the main properties of this very general hypothesis is that we want the Picard group of, of X to be BZ generated by OX of one. Okay, so, you know, that means that um, there's gonna, I guess, be a, a like a countable union of subspaces where that's not true, uh, essentially. Uh, right, you know, every time you like pick some kind of, you can always pick some kind of a curve uh, and look at, you know, hypersurfaces that go through that curve. Uh, I'm not sure, is it a countable union or just a finite union? But anyway, some union. Uh, anyway, you can pick a, you could pick a curve, like you can pick a line and look at quintic hypersurfaces through that line, then that's going to have an extra generator of the Picard group, which would be that line. Um, so you can you know cook up examples pretty easily where the Picard group has higher rank. Uh, so you know what we're doing here is we're trying to avoid those things. Of course, those would na naturally be situations that might be interesting to. To look at uh, the theory is going to be correspondingly more complicated. Uh, you know, one of the advantages of having Picard group of rank one is that when we're looking at stability, the degree of a you know the the churn class of a subsheaf, or like if we're, we're looking at a rank two bundle, if you have a sub line bundle, it's only it, there's only one number that tells you what's the churn class of that line bundle. Uh, if if the Picard group had higher rank, then you would have to talk about line bundles of you know different. Places in the Picard group, basically. Um, so this simplifies things a lot. Um, the other thing that's very simple in this case is that the canonical sheaf is OX of one. And that's because we're talking about degree five, and the canonical sheaf of P3 is OP3 of minus four. So altogether, we get five, we get one. Uh, that's a generator of the Picard group. That's extremely useful. Um, and just a general fact here is that. Um, if you have a surface inside P3, a hypersurface, you know, a surface, smooth surface inside P3, then it's H1 of twists of the structure sheaf, it's always going to vanish. And the H0 of twists of the structure sheaf is the same as H0 of OP3, then up to the degree, you know, strictly and less, strictly less than the degree of the hypersurface. So that's useful, and uh, I'll make, be making use of that implicitly without just saying so. So if we like, uh, say, like quadrics or something like that, or, you know, the space of cubics or the space of quadrics. On, on X or on P3, that's the same. So for example, H0 of OX of two has dimension 10. Uh, OX of three, I think has dimension 20 maybe, and OX of four has dimension 35, I think. Uh, I guess OX of five dimension 56, uh, I think. Uh, uh, okay, now here's some notation. So this is a little bit important to pay a little bit of attention to this slide because there's a distinction here. Um, well, the first step is just easy. So we'll let M of C2 without a bar on it. That's the moduli space of stable rank two bundles. Uh, we're fixing the de degree of the bundle to be an odd degree. So it, the, the degree O of one. And, and C2 is the second term class of the bundle. Uh, I should also say, that, uh, obviously, the case of we haven't looked, we haven't done this, but obviously something to do is to study the case of uh, bundles of degree zero. Uh, we don't have any results on that to say. Um, anyway, so we're looking at bundles of odd degree. Um, let me just comment down here. You know, since we're looking at bundles whose determinant is OX of one, that means that the slope is actually one half. And if you, it's a rank two bundle. So if you have a sub bundle, it's going to be a line bundle. So that the degree of the line bundle has to be an integer. So it can't be a half. There's no such thing as a semi stable but not, se not, but not stable bundle in, in this case. So that makes it easy to understand uh, 
you know, anything semi-stable is stable. So it means that the moduli space, we don't need to worry about whether we're looking at the open set of strictly stable or the open set of just semi-stable. Yeah, those are all the same. Okay, but now here's the thing uh, that we should pay attention to. So this M bar TF of C2, that's the moduli space of torsion-free sheaves. Sorry, there's an S. That's the moduli space of torsion-free sheaves <coughs> of rank two with those turn invariants. That contains M of C2 as an open subset. Okay. And on the other hand, let's take M of C2, the quantity bar. That's going to be the closure of M of C2 inside here. So the point is that this thing could and generally will have other irreducible components that are not in the closure of M of C2. So this M of C2 bar, that means the closure of M of C2, whereas the whole M torsion free of C2, that's why I put a TF superscript up here. This whole MTF of C2, that's all the stuff that's all torsion free sheet. Okay. So uh, these can sometimes be different as we'll see in some examples. Okay. And it's important to that semi-stability and stability are the same. Okay, now an important construction here. Uh, this, I put a footnote here because uh, this is of course not the first time it was used, but it was used to good effect by Igor Ryder and his thesis um, combining with the Bogomov Isagar inequality. Is, is the Sarah construction. So the Sarah construction expresses a rank two bundle as an extension of an ideal sheaf by alignment. So let's give, so this is the main example that we'll be talking about today. Uh, so let's just do it in that case. So let's suppose that the, a, the E has a section. So we think of the section as a map from OX into E. Then we take the quotient of that thing. So it turns out that the quotient of that thing is a rank one sheaf so it's a sheaf, it's a rank one torsion free sheaf. So that means it's double dual is gonna be a line bundle. It's, if you think about it, the, that, the degree of that line bundle and the degree of E is gonna be the degree of the sub plus the degree of the quotient. So if we say degree of E equals OX of one, then you know, equals one, then, um, and this is probably, I guess my definition of degree that would really be five in fact to be precise. But anyway, uh, what I mean by degree here is what is the element of the Picard group? Um, if, so if, the, if the determinant of E in the Picard group is OX of one, then this has the, the double dual of the sheaf has to be OX of one. So that means that this is, has the form of an ideal sheaf tensored by O of one, okay? So anytime you have a section of a bundle, it always gives you an exact sequence of this one. Uh, I guess, I, sorry, I need to maybe say one thing, which is we're assuming that the section doesn't exactly actually extend to a section uh, it doesn't, we're assuming it doesn't extend to a map from OX of one into E, which it, in this case is going to be the case. Um, okay, and so then JP and X is the ideal sheaf of a zero dimensional subscheme. Okay. And uh, if you count the turn invariants, you, you conclude in this, for the case, in this case, particular case, um, that the C2 of E is actually just the number of points in the subscheme P. Of course, if we took an O, uh, like an O of minus one into E into JP of two, that would, the number of points would be different from the, from C2. We'll see that later. Now what's, what kind of subschemes can occur in such an exact sequence? So this is kind of the fundamental thing that we would like to be looking at here. So the, there's basically two properties. The first property is that we notice that P, that the ideal sheaf of P has two generators. Let me just back up a minute in the slide. I'm sorry about this. But E is a rank two bundle, right? And you know, locally, aside from the trivialization of OX and one, locally, that means that we have two things which surject onto J, P, and X. That means the ideal has two generators, okay? And since it's a zero dimensional subscheme of a two dimensional space, that means it's locally a complete intersection. So P is a local complete intersection subscheme inside X. And the other condition is the main condition called the Kaley Baccarat condition. Uh, CB2, so it's the Kili Baccarat condition for quadrics in this case. Uh, we'll give the definition of that in the next talk. Uh, and then our main basic techniques are to try to use some kind of geometric arguments to understand what sort of postulation this subscheme can have. Let me just state the theorem. Uh, so the theorem that we'd like to show is the moduli space is, well, it's easy to see that it's empty. We'll see that right off the bat, but it's empty for C2 less than or equal to three. And the theorem is that it's irreducible for any value of C2 bigger than or equal to four. And also for C2 bigger than or equal to 10, it's good. That's to say generically smooth of the expected dimension. 
Um, so for C2 bigger than or equal to 10, also the bigger moduli space of torsion free sheaves is also good. So it also has dimension. All right, what's this? I mean, for C2 equals 10, for example, this dimension is 20, right? So for C2 equals 10, this also has dimension 20. Uh, however, it does, in, 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 in C2 equals 10, it actually has two irreducible components. It has the, the one which is the closure of the M of C2. We said that was irreducible. And it has a different component, which we'll see later. Uh, then for starting with C2 bigger than or equal to 11, it becomes the whole, the whole space becomes irreducible. And for, uh, for, for C2 between four and nine, we'll give explicit descriptions of the Cayley Bacharach subschemes that show up for a general quantum moduli space. Let me just finish uh, the first talk here with just a few comments here about uh, what type of future directions could be suggested by this type of result. So one thing is that when we're in the process, we'll see that we have actual, an actual much more explicit description of the moduli spaces for C2 equals four and five. <coughs> um, so I think a general question you can ask is, are for very, very low values of C2, or is there gonna be like some kind of explicit description of the moduli spaces? Uh, then another thing is that in the course of the argument, we end up pretty much talking about Cayley Bacharach subschemes in P3 without necessarily needing to use too much the fact that they're actually lying on our quintic surface. Um, as you'll see in some cases, we just forget about that entirely and then go back and fix that up later. Um, but so there's kind of a question, which is, is there some kind of a general study of Cayley Bacharach subschemes in P3? Um, you know, I, there's like, there's a paper by, by uh, Eisenbahn and Harris, for example, but I don't think they really have like a exhaustive sort of discussion of geometric properties of the Cayley Bacharach subschemes. But what we'll be seeing here is that usually when we have like when P is a Cayley Bacharach subscheme, it's usually for some kind of reason. And so it'd be nice to make those reasons more systematic. And then uh, I'd just like to finish by discussing a potential metric geometry counterpart of these questions. So remember from Donaldson theory that, that if, the, if C2 is zero, or I mean, if the delta invariant is zero, then we get a flat connection or a projectively flat connection. Um, now suppose that C2 is kind of small, like pretty, like as small as possible or very small, but it's not really equal to zero. You know, the delta invariant is not really equal to zero, but could that possibly mean, this is just a question, could that possibly mean that there's gonna be some kind of metric with some small curvature? So it's true that the Bachner formula is gonna give like an L2 bound on the curvature or something like that, but maybe I'm talking here about more of a, a better sort of, uh, C zero type of bound on the curvature or something like that. Um, well, if you had a, so if you have a bundle, if you think about just geometrically, you have a bundle with a connection that has a small curvature. What does that mean? It means that if you have a loop inside the base, um, then the monodromy around that loop is almost independent of the curvature, right? So in other words, if you have a loop in the base whose who's transport along the, that loop gives you some big sort of uh, matrix, then you know, the, the quote sort of what it looks like the monodromy matrix would be around that loop, then that's going to tell you that you have to actually have a big uh, disk that, that, I mean, if the loop is the boundary of a disk, that disk is going to have to be pretty big uh, in order to, to, to absorb the, that, the monodromy transformation along that, along that loop by some small amount of curvature. And let me just finish by uh, mentioning, uh, this, is just, this is an extremely vague type of conjecture, but you know, there was recent results of Rouleau and Urzua who said that there, that there exist simply connected surfaces whose turn slope is arbitrarily close to three. So three, C1 squared equals three C2 is kind of arbitrarily close to being true. Uh, of course, if C1 squared equals three C2, then we know that the variety is uniformized. Uh, and so it's not simply connected. But so here we have varieties maybe where C1 squared and 3C2 are not very far away, but they're simply connected. So the question is, would some kind of consideration like what I was saying in the previous slide, would that somehow or other be able to tell us that uh, the, the varieties in some kind of way, not really, I mean, like approximately not simply connected, which is to say, uh, you know, you might have like a, you might have a loop in, inside the space, but to make that loop, so the loop would be contractible, but maybe to make that loop be contractible, you would have to take a, like a really big disk, basically. Uh, so I'm gonna just sort of throw that out there in case anybody, I, I don't really have any ideas to how to treat this type of question, but uh, anyway.
but I wanted to just mention a couple of questions. So that uh, that's the that's the end of the first talk. Uh, All right, thank you. Let me clap for everybody. And are there any questions for Carlos? May I ask you one question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So indeed, you already told that you consider only Picard number one case for kintic, kintic surface. But may I ask you what happened when I consider something like a perma kintic in uh, modular space of boundaries and perma kintic? Then what, what what can be different from the Picard number one case? Uh, I'm putting, is it, that's going to have like a pretty big Picard group, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. We, you know. We've only done this one case, okay? So I'm, I'm sorry, but um, but you know, some. I mean, there's you know, you're already going to have a bit of a difficulty with discussing what does it mean to be a stable bundle, right? Because your your bundle might have some bundles that have you know different that are different places in the Picard group. I mean, I guess it probably doesn't have a lot of them, but uh, you know, in principle, like if we're talking about the Sarah construction, in principle, you'd have to look at things that you would get by the Sarah construction by Taking some some lines on bundle and then the quotient ideal sheaf bundle, but for lots of different possible unbundles, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's going to be more complicated, but I, I know I don't know what to say. I mean, that's an interesting question, but um, I, I haven't I haven't thought about exactly sort of how much more complicated that's going to be. Uh, oh, I see, I see. Uh, because I, I mean, anyway, if we consider paramagnetic with the symmetry, then maybe we can relate. Moduli with the Godot surface. That's why I'm asking this. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carlos, there's one question in the chat saying that is there a criteria criterion to decide when the torsion free sheaf is smoothable? Ah. Uh. uh. Well, I don't think there's a, I'm not sure there's a criterion. You know, as I said, we're going to see examples where uh, the torsion free moduli space and the, and the smoothable moduli space, I mean, uh, those can be different. Uh, we'll, we'll, see some, we'll see an explicit example uh, here. Uh, so, you know, so let's just say one thing, which is that uh, the, no, uh, that's not completely true, but yeah. Um, you know, it, it, if you're in a, if, I mean, if you happen, like, so for example, in the example we're going to see, if you happen to be in a space, in a, at a point where the dimension of the torsion free, uh, I mean, where, if you happen to be inside an uh, irreducible component of the torsion free moduli space, then you're going to have to be at a singular point of the moduli space if that joins on to a, to a component of the smoothable moduli space. See what I'm saying? Um, and that's going to be one of our examples here. There's going to, in the, in C two equals ten. There's going to be a, one component that's that's the closure of the bundle on joint space. There's going to be another component of the same dimension. So one thing you can say is that the place where those two components meet that has to be in a singular locus of modulated space. So that's a, maybe I mean a, a, some vague kind of re reply to that in the sense that, that that can tell you know in that particular case that can tell you like. Where, where the bundle can't be. I mean, if you take a torsion free bundle that's not in a singular point, you know, that's in a smooth point of the moduli space, but it's not locally free, well, then it's not going to be smoothable uh, to a. I mean, that's only in the case where the dimension of the torsion free piece is the same as the dimension of the smoothable piece. Um, but I don't, yeah, I, uh, I guess, is there a. I mean, in, in a certain way, that's kind of what the Cayley Baccarat condition is saying. I mean, it's. Saying a little bit, uh, you know, you could take just the direct sum of those two things. You know, in that, in that bundle thing, you could just take the direct sum of those two things. That would be a torsion free sheet. Of course, it's not stable, I guess, but uh, the, 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 the Cayley Bachrock condition is really a, a condition about how it is that you're going to get a, a, a smooth thing. Uh, so there's probably, I guess, there's probably an infinitesimal criterion that tells you that in some way, but. But I don't think there's any like easy way of telling uh, off the bat. 
All right. Um, so let's thank uh, Carlos again for the first talk, and we'll reconvene in about five minutes to uh, for the second talk. Let me clap for everybody again because. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, we continue to be very happy to have uh, Carlos Simpson here uh, talking or at this uh, FRG lecture series. Um, this will be his second lecture, uh, and he'll be talking about constructions and local properties, the Cayley Baccarat condition. Okay, uh, great. Thanks very much. Uh, so thank you again, once again, for uh, the opportunity to give these talks. This is great. Uh, let me share the screen. So can you guys see that? Okay, good. Okay, so this is for, for the second talk. Uh, let's look some more. So we'll, now we're gonna launch into the proof of the theorem that I stated before. Um, and so we'd like to look at more closely at the Sayre construction for rank two bundles. We'll be discussing the cayley baccarat condition. Uh, on zero dimensional subschemes. And we'll also discuss a little bit the local deformation theory, uh, just statements, I guess, uh, how, it, how it interacts with the Sarah construction. Uh, okay, so we'll keep the notations from above. Uh, let me not put back uh, if anybody has any questions. Well, I guess, uh, uh, is it, did you, uh, you put on the slides, you put the slides on the website already, right? Yes, I did. And if uh, it's on the website right above the schedule, if anybody wants to okay, so access it from there. Notations are on page 26. Okay. So anyway. Um, okay. So, uh, so let's just look at some general considerations for moduli space. Uh, so this is Kuranishi theory. So this tells us how to look locally at the structure of the moduli space, a uh, very general and useful uh, discussion. Um, so in our case, we're looking at bundles of odd degrees, so semi-stability and stability coincide. And aside from scalar automorphisms, there's, the bundles have no automorphisms, so we don't need to worry about any kind of stacky aspect or anything like that. Uh, okay, so uh, now, now the tangent space, of course, is the, um, uh, you know, also, of course, H1 of x ox equals zero, so that means that there's not going to be a, a deformation. There's not, the trace, the trace part of the, endomorphism is not going to contribute to the deformation theory. Uh, so we just look at the trace-free endomorphism. Uh, sorry, this is an extra parenthesis here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so n, n0 of E is a rank three bundle of trace-free endomorphisms. Uh, in our case, it's roughly speaking the second symmetric product of E with itself. Awesome. And the tangent space of the deformations, the tangent space of the moduli space is the deformation space, H1 of the trace-free endomorphism. And the space of obstructions is the H2 of the endomorphism. Now, what does it really mean to say that we have a space of obstructions? Well, that's maybe a little bit complicated. Uh, but the, we can just put that, all, that whole theory into a one big sort of uh, uh, technical tool called Kuranishi theory and just give a simple statement. And this pretty much tells us a, a basically everything we need to know, which is that we have a Kuranishi map, for, which is a map of germs of complex analytic spaces. Uh, I didn't write the germ here. This is germs at the origin of complex analytic spaces from the H1 space to the H2 space, okay? But this, be careful, this is not, we're not talking about a linear map here. We're talking about a, a nonlinear complex analytic map. You know, uh, later versions of Kuranishi's papers proved that it was convergent. It wasn't even obvious at the start that it was convergent. But, uh, so a priori just given by formal power series, but in fact, it's convergent. Um, and so we have an analytic map and the linear term of this map at the origin is trivial. Uh, so that means that, and then the, it, it just says that the moduli space is the germ at zero of the zero set of this map. So it's just phi inverse of zero. And since the linear term is trivial, that means that the H1 space is identified with the Zariski tangent space of the moduli space. Okay. And this Kuranishi identification is compatible with that. So what it's that tells us, the main thing that tells us is that there's an expected dimension for the moduli space at E. Um, so when you say expected dimension, you might say the question is expected by whom, right? Uh, the, the expected dimension we're using here 
is using the trace free endomorphism. If you, if you took the trace endomorphisms, not the, the, the full endomorphisms, you wouldn't get the right answer, you might say, because it turns out that uh, the, 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 the projection of the obstruction into the, into the trace part, into the diagonal part of the matrices is always trivial. So that sort of doesn't count for counting dimensions, you might say. Um, if we had a non-trivial H1 space, you might say the, the dimension would be that H1 is the full endomorphism minus the H2 of the trace free endomorphism. Anyway, so that's the expected dimension. And that depends, we can calculate that by riemann roch And in our case, so in the case where the, the bundle has degree one and uh, you know, has determinant OX1, and where the, we have an X as a hypersurface of degree five, the calculation tells us that the expected dimension is four C2 minus 20. Okay, so that's an important number to keep in mind. Uh, So if H2 equals zero, so if the space of obstructions is equal to zero, then we get the M is good, which is to say it's generically smooth of the expected dimension, right? Let's just go back to the Kuranishi theory. If this space is zero, then of course, phi is always equal to the zero map. And that the Kuranishi theory just says that the locally M looks like a germ, you know, the germ of M at, at, at the point E looks like the germ of this complex vector space at the origin. So it's just a smooth space. So we immediately say that, uh, that, so we immediately see that M is good at, at E. So it's generically smooth of, of the expected dimension. In fact, it's smooth at E of the expected dimension. Um, so uh, the other thing we get from Carnishi theory is that the dimension is always bigger than or equal to the expected dimension. Because that's just telling us that, let me just go back again. The fiber of this map phi, the dimension of the fiber of the map is always bigger than or equal to the dimension of the of the source space minus the dimension of the target space. That's all we're saying. But you know, in, in general, the, a map might the, the fiber dimension might be sort of jumping, so to speak, uh, or even you know the the image of this phi map might not be the whole space in it or something like that. Uh, but so so we can almost say that the dimension is always bigger than or equal to the expected dimension. Uh, in particular, that tells us that if, if for some reason we can bound the, lo the dimension of the locus of bundles where the obstruction is, uh, is positive, where the obstruction exists, if that bound is strictly smaller than the expected dimension, then it tells us that at least that irreducible component of M of C2 is good. So I should have said irreducible component here. Okay. Now, a good way of getting a hold of the space of obstruction is by applying Sarah duality. So this is on a surface, this is gonna be dual, ser dual to the space of what we call co-obstructions because they're dual of, of, of obstructions. And that's H zero of the trace free endomorphisms tensor KX. And now, you know, in retrospect, after uh, years of working on Higgs bundles, uh, which is my case, um, we immediately noticed that this really looks a lot like the, the notion of a Higgs field. And in fact, if you take Hitchens original definition of a Higgs field on a curve, and just transpose it directly with the same notation to a, to a higher dimensional variety, this is actually what you get, right? Because, you know, in Hitchens' paper, uh, the Higgs field had coefficients not in omega 1x, but in kx. Of course, on a curve, those are the same. But uh, so here we're getting a Higgs field with coefficients in kx, but here the kx is the canonical bundle, not the omega 1x. So this is some kind of Higgs field. Um, in other words, it's an endomorphism valued section of the canonical unbundle. Uh, so the Higgs fields that take part in non-abelian Hodge theory, which some of you may have heard of, um, those have coefficients in the rank two bundle with omega one x of differential form. That that being the other generalization from curves. Uh, so this is not the same. So this is not the same type of Higgs field, but some kind of Higgs field. And sometimes people have said that uh, maybe there's some kind of maybe kapustin wheaton or something like that equations uh, having to do with these things. And uh, sometimes when I try to look for those in the literature, I don't find them. So I'm not completely sure about that, but uh, I think there are some gauge type of equations having to do with these, these Higgs fields. Um, okay, anyway, but, but one thing this tells us is that we can just sort of transpose from, from the curve case from Hitchens paper, we can transpose this theory of spectral varieties to say that if we have a bundle with a co-obstruction, then it's gonna have a spectral variety that's a sub-variety of the total space of, of the of the canonical bundle, line bundle, which will be finite over X. Okay. 
And this bundle E is going to sort of be given by direct image of a line level on the spectral variety. Of course, there's different cases. So the spectral variety might be a nice, like sort of uh, generically smooth variety, but it might also be a, a non reduced variety concentrated at the zero section. That would be the case where the Higgs field is no potent. That's actually a common case in, in our situation. In fact, the largest dimensional component of the of singular locus actually comes from nil potent. But, anyway. but using so following out that type of reasoning, we can obtain some bounds for the number of co obstructions and for the dimension of the locus of bundles that has the co obstruction. So let me just record here the statement that you get. Um, I think we also need to do some other arguments to get to this theorem. I mean, this is not just following from directly from these uh, dimension bounds. But uh, anyway, this the statement we get after adding in sufficiently many arguments about. Uh, dimensions and stuff um, is we get that the moduli space is good for C2 bigger than or equal to 10. In other words, all the irreducible components have the expected dimension and they're generically smooth. Okay. Now we'd like to view a bundle as coming from the Sarah construction. So in order to get do the Sarah construction, we need to get an exact sequence. So we need to have some kind of section of the bundle. Uh, the main case we'd like to consider, especially today, is the case where we just have a section in H0E. So let's look at, before we get started, let's look at how we can get to a conclusion that, that E has to have a section. So the Euler characteristic of E has the formula 5n squared plus 10 minus C2. Uh, okay. You also have, uh, um, in our case, the dual of E is actually equal to E of minus 1. And doing, if you have a if you have a rank two bundle with trivial determinant or you know with a fixed determinant, if it had trivial determinant, it would be equal to its dual. If the determinant is O of one, so the dual is E of minus one. Um, so if we take E of n dual tensor kx, that's E of minus n. So Sarah duality tells us that H i of E of n is is dual to H two minus i of E of minus n. For n equals zero, this tells us that H. Uh, the H0, H0 of E and H2 of E are the same. So if we plug that into the, into the Euler characteristic formula, we get the Euler characteristic is two times H0 of E minus H1 of E. So this is useful because it tells us that if we have the Euler characteristic being positive, then we get that E has, has to have a section. And if we go back to the formula, uh, n equals zero, right? So if 10 minus C2 is positive, so if C, if C2 is strictly less than 10, then the chi is going to be positive. Uh, so that tells us that whenever C2 is less than or equal to nine, we get H0 of E is at least one. And similarly by the formula, if C is less, if C2 is less than or equal to seven, then we get a three over there. And we get H0 of E has to be at least two. Yeah, if H0 of E was equal to one, then you would have two times one equals uh, three, right? So that would work. So H0 of E has to be at least equal to two if C2 is less than or equal to seven. So in any case, whenever C2 is less than or equal to nine, that tells us that E is gonna have a section. So it means we can view it as this given by the Sarah construction with a subbundle OX, okay? That's like the easiest case. Of course, you know, given that E is gonna be stable, it's not supposed to have a subbundle of degree one, for example. Um, so the, the best you can do is it OX sitting in time. Uh, let me just get a, to a general construction, a uh, slightly more general construction of Cayley Baccarat before getting moving on. Um, so suppose in general we have a, a map from O of minus M into E, given by a section of E of M. Then the exact sequence looks like this O of minus M into E into J P and X of M plus one. Um, as I said before, we have we should assume that S doesn't come up from a section of E of m minus one. Uh, if it did, then then we would have then this wouldn't be a torsion free sheep. There would be torsion sheep. But if we assume that, then this is going to be really an ideal sheep. Um, the subscheme P is then this, it's the vanishing it's the vanishing scheme of uh, of the section S basically. So. 
So we should think of P. So P is a zero dimensional subscheme. So to, to, if you're first, you know, if you're new to this theory, you might say, just figure that B is a, is a collection of points. Okay. But you should be careful that that's not, that's an oversimplification. Okay. So I just want to say this. Uh, the, the real, the technical difficulties in, in the proof come from the fact that P might be a, a subscheme that has some non reduced pieces. Okay. Um, and if you're talking to, trying to talk about, you know, P being contained in a curve or something like that, then uh, you have to be careful, right? Uh, P, is, P might be some non reduced sub zero dimensional subscheme contained in a curve, which might be singular. And this understanding that situation is not, not really easy. And that's like what took a long time to understand the proof, basically. Uh, I'm, I think we're mostly not really going to see that here, unfortunately. But, uh, but I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this is an, if we think of P as being just a distinct set of points, that's definitely an oversimplification. Uh, that's, you can't, you cannot assume that a priori, and at least unless you prove it. Um, I mean, you know, that, it's not like the main goal, but like one of the goals, which you think of trying to do when you're doing, looking at the subject is say, oh, could, could I prove that P was a set of distinct points? That, it sounds like that might simplify your life uh, considerably. Uh, something, it, often it doesn't really simplify your life all that as much as you thought it would, but anyway. Uh, okay, so, but you know, as I said, if you're new to this, just think of P as being a collection of distinct points, okay? Um, so the ideal, each piece of, as we said before, P is locally complete intersection. So uh, each piece, each local piece of P has a uh, has two generators. Uh, so let me just go step right down to the footnote here. So the local piece, so the fact that the P is local complete intersection uh, means that the local pieces of P are Gorenstein uh, things, and so they have what's called a socle. So there's in fact a unique ideal of length one. Uh, so I mean, you can sort of draw the diagram. So I mean, like a typical case would be like P is locally defined by like x cubed and equals zero and y squared equals zero, for example. Then you sort of draw a diagram with with six little squares, you know, two by three. Uh, and then the 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 unique ideal of length one would be sort of the the square which is opposite the zero zero square, right? The 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 zero I guess zero 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 one the the one two square the sixth square up there. That would be sort of the, the unique ideal of length one. Uh, so it turns out that each local piece in a Gorenstein thing has, has a unique ideal of length one, and that's the thing we're going to be using here. But anyway, so I just wanted to say that. But so now, uh, now we're done with the footnote. Uh, so let's just go back to here. So uh, suppose P has the local complete intersection property, then the main constraint that it needs to satisfy is what's called the Cayley Bakarov condition. So let me explain what that says. So the Cayley Bacharach condition says the following thing. This is important, so this was not supposed to be. Um, it says the following thing. Suppose we take a subscheme, which is roughly speaking all of the points except for one of them. So we take a subscheme which has the, the same number of points as p minus one. So one smaller number of points. And technically, it means that locally we should be defined by this ideal that we saw in the SOCOL. But you know, if you're just thinking of p as being a bunch of points. Then we just take all the points except for one. Okay. And then suppose we have an F, which is a section of the line bundle under incorrect under consideration. So Cayley Bachrock is going to be a condition that has to do with the line bundle, right? So, so now it says suppose we have a section of the line bundle that vanishes on the subscheme. So the vanishes on P prime. Then it's supposed to also vanish on P. Okay. In other words, it says if you take any subset of like suppose it's 10 points. If you take any subset of nine out of the 10 points, then it should all, then a section of that bundle should also vanish on the 10th point, okay? That's the Cayley Bacharach condition. And, well, I'm not explaining that here, but uh, the, the reason for that, that's, exact, that's kind of related to the question that was asked before, which is what's the condition to get a locally free extension? This, this, this condition, that's the condition that you need to get a, a, to, such that there exists an element of X1 Remember, we're looking at extension classes here. There exists an element of the X group that parameterizes these extensions with the property that's sort of non-trivial enough at each of the points that it gives you a locally free extension. So we're sort of uh, we're sort of measuring. I mean, when we take all the points except for one, we're, we're sort of measuring whether the, there's going to be an extension class which is going to be able to make the extension E locally free at that at that extra point, basically. 
And if you go through zero duality and X groups and stuff like that, then you can conclude that this is the condition. Okay, so in our case, we have a hypersurface of degree five. So K is equal to OX and one and M equals, uh, I mean, in our case, M equals zero. So K of two M plus one is OX of two M plus two. Uh, as we said before, we have this Euler characteristic thing, which tells us that there exists a section with M equals zero. So we're going to be looking at M equals zero. So in our case, C2 less than or equal to nine, we're looking for subschemes that satisfy the Cayley Baccarat condition with respect to OX of two. Okay. So we want subschemes that satisfy Cayley Baccarat with respect to quadrics. So if I go back to the definition, it means we want a subscheme with the property that if we have, if we take N minus, like, with, let's say N or K points, let's say, if we take K minus one of those points and take a quadric that passes through K minus one of those points, it has to also pass through the, the K point, the last one. That's Cayley Baccarat. That's a really, I mean, a, when you start playing around with this condition, it's really interesting. Um, you know, there's been lots of papers written about that, which I'm not referring to here, but, uh, but it's, it's kind of like a fun condition to play with because, you know, when you start out, you don't necessarily see that there would necessarily exist such a thing. Then you start to understand that, well, you know, if, if, all, if they're all lying on the line, then maybe that really holds and so on. And that type of thing. So in, our, in fact, so we're going to just give some examples. We're going to give the examples which enter into our discussion uh, of the Cayley Baccarat condition. Namely, we'll give the examples which are the gen general examples for all the, the 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 generic points of the irreducible components of our moduli spaces. Of course, this is really. I mean, we're we're not really explaining how to prove the theorems. I mean, I'll also try to explain a little bit about how some of the proofs go, but. Um, just, just saying what those Cayley, just saying what those Cayley Baccarat subschemes are, that doesn't constitute a proof that there aren't some other ones. Basically, one, right? So, what you're really trying, I mean, the proof that you need to prove, you need to prove that there aren't some other Cayley Baccarat subschemes, or more precisely, the dimension of the space of Cayley Baccarat subschemes for some other reason uh, is smaller than the expected dimension of the moduli space. Okay, so let's let's give the, the our first proof here. Let's prove that P is not going to have length less than or equal to three. So let's suppose it has length three, for example. So remember, we have to look at length two subscheme. So a length two subscheme is either going to be two distinct points or a double point. In any case, that's going to define a line inside P3. In all these discussions, we're assuming you know, we're, we're considering X as a subset of P3. So we're doing these the geometric arguments inside P3. So we get a line inside P3 that contains two of those points. Now suppose that the suppose that the third point is already on the line, right? If we have three points on a line, then if we take two of those three points, then we can find a degree two polynomial that has those two zeros, but those are there, there were, those are its only two zeros. So it's not going to be zero on the third point. That if you think about it, that works even if like the three points are all three points on, you know, if it's a triple length, a length three point in the in one location or whatever. Um, that the argument works the same way. Uh, so, uh, so that's not going to satisfy Cayley Baccarat, right? If uh, Cayley Baccarat said, says if we take two of the points and take a, a degree two polynomial, then that has to also vanish on the third point. That's clearly not the case for three points on a line. Okay. Now, suppose P is not, suppose that P is not contained in the line. Well, we had this line that contained two of the points. Now, P it means that P has a is a point in some, that's not in the line. Okay. Then if we take a, 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 a general plane that goes through that line, that general plane is not gonna be, is not gonna pass through the, the third point, okay? And so, um, you, I mean, think of, the, you know, take that plane and multiply by some other plane to get a, a degree two thing. Uh, and that's gonna violate the Cayley Baccarat condition, right? Um, but one, you know, one comment is that if, if something satisfies CB2, it also has to satisfy CB1 and so on. Right. Uh, there's, there's an, uh, I'm not writing these down, but there's a number of properties like that, which I'll let you imagine. Um, so we, so in the case where the three points are not collinear, it's not even CB1. Okay. And so if you make you think a teeny bit about the case, so maybe it was three points that were curvilinear, but they weren't contained in a line. So that it was a three points along the curve, but the curve had some curvature. So, uh, so two of the points can define the line, but that line was tangent, but not but not uh, not osculating to, to the to the curve. Okay, then if you take a plane, that plane is not going to contain the third point, uh, right? 
So there, the, then our subscheme is going to be the two points rather than the three, the, the length two subscheme, but it's not going to contain the third one. Uh, so that's why I said you have to think about these arguments in the case where P is not necessarily a reduced collection of points also. Anyway, so this is the proof that P doesn't have length three. So this is the proof that there's no bundles of C2 less than or equal to three. Uh, so we're done with that. Now let's consider the case of P has length four. Okay, so now the first case is suppose P is contained in a line. So now if you think about what happened for, for three points, but making it for four points, well, in that case, it's gonna work, right? So if we take four points on a line, if we choose three of those points and look at a, a degree two polynomial that vanishes at those three points, well, that it has to vanish along the full line, right? You, you can't have a degree two polynomial on P1 that vanishes at three points, right? It has only two zeros. So any degree two pawn, any quadric surface inside P3 that contains three points on a line has to actually contain that line. And so if, if, if P consisted of four points on the line, then it would have to contain the fourth point. So that's, that's the Cayley, that's like the essence of the Cayley Bachrock condition is that example. Um, okay. So that's the CB2 property. So any four points on a line satisfies the CB2 property. And if you think about it, that works for any subscheme of length four on, on the line. So let's look at the proof that similarly to the one we did for, for degree three, let's look at the, for length three, let's look at the proof that all of the CB2 subscremes of length four arise in this way. So this proof is a representative of the proof of other similar types of statements that we'll need uh, as we're going along. Um, okay, so suppose we have an LCI subscheme of length four satisfying CB2. Okay. Now, if we take a, th a length three subscheme, then that's going to define a plane. So think of three points that three points define a plane through those three points. If you think about it, I mean, even, even if it's a subscheme of, of, of length three, there's always going to be a plane passing through that length three subscheme. Um, so then, since P satisfies CB2, it also satisfies CB1. So that plane would have to contain P. So let's see. So suppose we can choose a plane that meets P in a subscheme of length at least two, but not containing it. Okay. Then uh, what did I say this was like? Okay, so we can introduce an important concept which is called the residual subscheme. So uh, it, you know, if you take if you take a, a subscheme of a, a zero-dimensional subscheme and you sort of intersect it with a divisor. Then you can kind of subtract that intersection, and you can get a subscheme called the residual subscheme, which has the length, uh, the length of p minus the length of the intersection. Uh, so it, it's defined. It, uh, we'll see the definition in, in a minute more generally. Um, it's defined sort of by the annihilator. Uh, uh, okay, so let's take a, a plane that meets p in a subscheme of length two, but doesn't contain it. Then we take the residual subscheme. Um, well, if if p intersect h is has length three, then the CB one condition uh, says that p in, p is subset of h. So that was that we were assuming that wasn't the case. So we have p intersect h equals two. Uh, so our residual subscheme also has length two. Then we take any other plane which cuts the residual subscheme in, in only one point that of course exists. Then we take h union h prime. We got a quadric. With the property that p intersect q uh, has length three, not four, and that's con contradicting CB two condition. So in that way, we can conclude that uh, any plane that meets in a subscheme of length two has to be has to contain p. And if you think about it, that implies that p is contained in a line. Anyway, that's the proof of that. So let's just uh, let's just make a sort of an aside here to define the residual subscheme because that's usually useful. Um, so in general, if we have a subscheme of X and we have a Cartier divisor, we can take the we can take OP and then map to OP of D, OP tensor OX of D. Uh, you know, this is roughly speaking multiplying by the, the equation. And you know, locally D D is given by some equation. We just multiply by that equation. Then we will let o, OR be the image of that map. Okay. So this is something which is on the one hand, it's a quotient of OP. And therefore, it's the quotient of OX by an ideal. And on the other hand, it's also a subscheme of 
it's also an ideal inside OP. I mean, uh, uh, OOR tensor OX of minus D is also an ideal inside OP. And from that, we get the formula that, uh, so uh, uh, OR is the, is the, I mean, uh, sorry. I mean, we see that OR is, is the structure sheaf of a zero dimensional subscheme called the residual. And uh, the, the length of the intersection plus the length of the residual is equal to P. And I'm not gonna list them here, but there's a bunch of nice properties with respect to the Cayley backrock condition. Roughly speaking, if you like, if, you, if we had our CB2 thing and we intersect with a plane, then the residual subscheme satisfies CB1. Uh, so it sort of subtract the, the you know, if you have, if, if the subscheme satisfies CB for a line middle O of M and you re intersect with a section of O of N, then the residual subscheme satisfies Cayley Bachrock for M minus N. Okay, so now let's get to this case of length five. Um, so as in the previous case, we can have five points on a line and a uh, proof similar to the previous one uh, tells us that uh, all of the CB2 subschemes of length five actually come from uh, five points on a line. Uh, and if you think about it, five points on a line actually satisfies CB3 by the same argument that we gave. So in, in particular, it satisfies CB2. So now we classify the CB, the CB2 subschemes of length four and five. So that tells us uh, that roughly speaking tells us what are the bundles uh, of, of C2 equals four and C2 equals five. Uh, there's a little bit of a question still. I mean, uh, the line is not uniquely determined because we, we chose a section, but there might be the, the space of sections might have um, might have a higher dimension. In, in, in fact, for four and five, it has dimension three. In fact, uh, so the line is not a uniquely determined invariant. We'll see in a, in a little while. Maybe next time uh, we'll see the, the more precise description. So now let's just continue with our kind of examples of Kelly Bachrock type scheme uh, to kind of give the, the full idea of what type of condition can happen. So let's uh, let's turn to the case where the the size of, that where p has length six. So I'm not going to do the proof anymore that these are the, this is the generic example. Okay, so and those proofs get harder and harder as we go along. Uh, Maybe we'll do the case nine a little bit uh, briefly, possibly. Uh, but I'm not. I'm, I'm no longer doing the proof that, in general, that, that that these are. This is the only possibility. I'm just saying that these are examples of Kelly Bachrock subschemes. Okay. Well, okay. Our P. Uh, it turns out it has to be a container plane, uh, right? Because we actually saw by the earlier characteristic argument that H zero of E is at least equal to two. And if you look at the exact sequence, that tells you H zero of J P and X of one has to be at least one. So that tells you that P has to be contained in the plane. Okay. So if we, if we let C be the intersection of the plane with X, so that's a degree five curve inside the plane H. Um, now, if we take a subscheme of length five, um, we, so remember now P is contained in a plane H. If we take a subscheme of length five, that's five points in a plane. So that determines a plane conic. Now, if CB, if P satisfies CB2, that means that that plane conic has to contain the, the sixth point, right? It has to contain all of P. So the conclusion is that we have a quadric Q, which defines a plane conic, and P is actually a sub, sub scheme of Q intersect H intersect X. And so here's the part where, so let's just suppose that Q intersect H is a smooth conic. I'm saying this is the general case, and you have to just believe me here. Uh, well, then Q intersect H is, is a P1, and we can just do a calculation for uh, sections of line bundles on P1. And in fact, it's O, it's the Cayley Bachrock for, for P1 for the line bundle OP1 of four, which is, you know, OP3 of two restricted to the, con to the plane conic is OP1 of four. And if we have a subscheme of length six inside P1, it's going to satisfy, for the same type of reason, Cayley Bachrock for O of four, for OP1 of four. So, so any subscheme P that lies on a smooth plane conic uh, is going to satisfy Cayley Bachrock. And it turns out that's the general case. Okay, and then you can use that to count the dimensions. Uh, now, what if, so that treats the case six. Okay, so uh, uh, now for the case P equal, uh, length of P equals seven, uh, 
as before, we have P is contained in a plane because remember the our condition for the Euler characteristic of the was if if C two is less than or equal to seven, then then E has two sections. Okay. So uh, now the general case now is when suppose that the curve H intersect X is a smooth quintic in the plane, and now this the general situation is P consists of seven points in general position on C. Well, okay, suppose we have six of those seven points, then they're also going to be in general position on the curve C. Uh, and the curve C is a plane quintic. Okay, so um, so they're not going to all be contained in a conic, basically. Right? Any any five of them would define a plane conic, but that conic, conic has to intersect, right? It can't be equal to the quintic, right? So it's a conic. Uh, so it has to intersect the conic in some points. And it, our sixth point, which is also in general position, is not contained in that conic. So um, so if we have a if we have a uh, if we have a degree two hypersurface inside P three that contains uh, that contains P prime, then it has to actually vanish on the on the whole plane H, and so it has to contain P. Right? This is this is this is really typical of this type of I mean, how you get to this type of condition. Right? You show that you want to show that if your section vanishes on subscheme P prime, then you want to show it vanishes on P. But the easy way to do that is to show it vanishes on a much bigger thing that contains P. I mean, uh, it's kind of, it's a little rare. We'll see this in a minute, but it's a little more rare that you get something that just really vanishes at that extra point. Okay, so that's the case, P, uh, length of P equals eight. Uh, okay, in this case, uh, in the general situation is where uh, we're gonna, so, you know, uh, the Cayley Bachrach condition means, among other things, that the number of conditions imposed by P on degree two things has to be uh, no more than, than the size of P minus one, right? Because the P, the pre prime stuff imposes already all the conditions for P. So, uh, so P doesn't impose eight conditions, it only composes, imposes at most seven conditions on the on a, o, OX of two, right? So OX two has dimension 10. Um, so something that imposes three conditions on a 10 dimensional space, it means there's a three dimensional space of stuff that satisfies those conditions. So there's gonna be three quadrics and the general case here is that those three quadrics have uh, intersect transversally in eight reduced points, okay? And so the Cayley Bachrach condition says, you know, if those are the three quadrics defined by things that pass through P prime, then P had better equal that set of eight points. And so the, the statement is that, that that those are the, th those are actually Cayley Baccarat. So the the construction of Cayley Baccarat uh, things of degree eight. It's these are what were called Cayley octets by Dolgorukov, and I'm, I guess they were called by, by people before that. It was Dolgorukov who pointed out to us that the terminology for these things is Cayley octet. Uh, so you take three quadrics in P three and to look at their common intersection. That's eight points. It turns out that satisfies the Cayley Baccarat for for quadrics. Okay. Uh, the proof of that is by looking at the elliptic curve, right? The intersection of two of those quadrants is an elliptic curve. Then you look at linear systems on the elliptic curve, and you see that if it vanishes on seven of the points, then it has to vanish on the eighth point. You know, basically, you don't you don't have a linear system on an elliptic curve. I mean, um, how to say this? Um, if you have a degree one line bundle on an elliptic curve, then uh, that that's just O of, of a point, basically, right? That, that's kind of cool. That's the, basically what's going on here. So, so uh, you know, a discussion of line bundles on an elliptic curve is going to tell us that the, the the third quadric has to, if it vanishes on seven of the points, then it also has to vanish on the eighth point. So that's how you prove C two. So, you know, in some sense, we're still doing. So, we're not really doing. We're not saying saying that our section vanishes on the elliptic curve, but we are still using this elliptic curve, which is not contained in X, right? It's contained in P3. So we're using that in some way to, to detect this Cayley Baccarat condition. Uh, so, from what I said here, that tells us some Cayley Baccarat subschemes of P3, but it doesn't tell us necessarily that there are subschemes of our quintic surface X. Okay, so there's going to be a subvariety of the parameter space of choices of Q1, Q2, Q2, P, Q3, such that that thing is actually contained in X. And so there's a question about showing that that thing is irreducible. And here's what's told us a very nice argument, which we'll see. We'll see another version of that argument later. 
uh, using monogamy uh, that tells you that you can actually show that, that the space of choices is irreducible. I will not do that here. We'll do a similar argument later. Okay, so, so this gives an irreducible family of CB2 subschemes of length eight. And then the case of length nine is a little bit more similar to the case of length seven. So in this case, we're gonna have a two dimensional space of quadrics. We let C equal Q1 intersect Q2. Uh, we let P be a choice of nine out of the 20 points in C intersect X. Then you can see that at any section of O of two that vanishes on P prime uh, has to vanish on C. So that's a little bit like the case of, uh, of the plane. It, it, for, for, for length seven, that was the, that role was playing, played by the plane uh, by the plane conic. So here it's this elliptic curve. Uh, let's just go on here. Uh, okay, so I don't know. I mean, I shouldn't really probably call this a meta conjecture, but it's like some kind of question or something like that, uh, which is, is it somehow they're going to be true that anytime you have something that satisfies Kaley Bacharach, that at least you can sort of see a geometric reason as to why it does, right? All the things we've seen so far, you can always give a geometric reason why it satisfies Kaley Bacharach. So I'm, I don't think we've really come across, at least in this, in what we've done here, I don't think we've come across a thing where you have something that satisfies Kaley Bacharach, but just for, you don't understand the reason why it satisfies Kaley Bacharach. Uh, so I guess um, maybe by Bacharach's uh, principle, that should actually exist somehow, but. Uh, I mean, I think that's a bit of a question, which is, you know, to what extent is, are we always going to have some kind of geometrical reason for a Kelly Bacharach condition? Uh, so I'm sure, you know, that's probably really not reasonable to think that would always be true, but um, maybe it could be true in some kind of under some hypothesis. Uh, okay, so let's just put all this stuff together um, into a table that tells us about the irreducible components of what we've done so far. As I said, I didn't, we haven't done the proofs, right? We did the proof for four, maybe similar proof for five. We didn't do the proof for six, seven, eight, nine, which are kind of involved. Uh, I think I'll probably be skipping this. I think that I have a little discussion in the slides of the proof for nine uh, later, which I think we're going to skip. Just a minute here. Um, anyway, but this is the result of the table. So the table says that in terms of values of C2 between four and nine, then we get dimension of the moduli space is two, three, seven, nine, 13, 16. I didn't do those calculations, but those you can do. They're not too difficult, except for maybe in the low dimensions, you have to be a little careful as to the fact that we chose the line, for example, you have to be careful that there's several different, sorry, the same bundle has several different choices of a line. Um, so let me just record the expected dimension, right? That's four C two minus 20. And the space of, the dimension of the space of obstruction, uh, these don't always add up either, right? Um, so, uh, so what it turns so if you think about it a little bit, the right this, the dimension of the space of obstructions, right? The dimension of the space of obstructions plus the expected dimension is equal to the dimension of the Zariski tangent space, right? So the sum of these two things is equal to the dimension of the Zariski tangent space at a general point. Of uh, so when I say dimension of the space of obstructions, I mean dimension of the space of obstructions at a general point of the moduli space. So at a general point of the moduli space, if you take the sum of these two things, the expected dimension plus the space of obstructions, that's the dimension of the Zariski tangent space, right? That's the H one. Okay. So here that's again two. And here that's three. Here three and four is seven. But here three and eight, that's eleven rather than nine. So in this case, it's bigger. What does that mean? It means that at, the, at a general point. The Zariski tangent space is bigger than the, the, the dimension of the Zariski tangent space is bigger than the dimension of the moduli space. What does that mean? It means that the, that point is a non reduced point of the moduli space. Okay, so, so that's the case here. Here, 12 plus 1 does equal 13, but 16 plus 1 is 17, not 16. So in the cases of C2 equals 7 and 9, we get the, the moduli space is generically non reduced. As I said, I'm sorry that I didn't do the I didn't say here the calculations of the dimensions nor of the space of obstructions and so on, but those you can do. That's why I said here that the non-reduced cases are those where the obstruction dimension plus the expected dimension is bigger than the dimension.
So the main thing that we need to do uh, here that we needed to do is to check a bunch of cases. Uh, so for these cases from four to nine, uh, the main thing we needed to do was to show that the components that I said before. So what I said before was how to construct a kaley bacharach subscheme, right? So if you construct a kaley bacharach subscheme by the by the theorem for the Sarah construction, that tells you that you get a, a bundle, right? So that gives you a construction of bundles and you can calculate the family, you know, the dimension of, of that family bundles and so on. Uh, that, this gives you a construction of bundles. And what you need to show is that that's the only construction of bundle of a family bundles of that dimension. Uh, so, uh, so you need to show that any more special position cases of the subscheme P or positions of the plane, the quadrics, and so on, uh, they, they don't add a new irreducible component. And so uh, you just have to check lots of cases. Okay, four minutes to go here. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, briefly discuss this in at least one case. So let's take, for example, C2 equals nine. This is just a brief construction, but I mean, uh, this just goes for pages and pages and pages of discussion. Uh, as I said, you have to deal with the property that the, the fact that P, you don't know that P is a, a reduced collection of points, for example. P could, could have points that are uh, schematic points, for example. And the, the, all the curves and stuff like that that show up here, they might be singular, right? At some point, you know, in, in the discussion before, I said that let's suppose that well, such and such an intersection was smooth, like the elliptic curve Q1 intersect Q2. Let's suppose it's a smooth elliptic curve. Well, that that's actually, uh, it, it's a degree four curve inside P3, but uh, it could be, you know, like four lines or something like that. Uh, so you have to deal with all those types of cases, basically. Um, so let's look at the case of length nine a little bit more concretely here. So let's um, let's just see the 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 part that says that um, the the a general point doesn't impose less than or equal to seven conditions on. Quadrics, right? That's one of the points you need to verify. So suppose it did, then we have a subspace of quadrics containing at least three in linearly independent ones, Q1, Q2, Q3. But Q has to be contained in the intersection. Okay. But now Q has P has nine points. So that means this intersection can't just be a length eight subscheme. Okay. Because it's supposed to contain a subscheme of length nine. So it means that this intersection actually has to have. Uh, some positive dimensional component. This is kind of typical of what goes on here. Uh, so, our, so, our, so we've got, the, so, you know, suppose we had, suppose P imposed less than or equal to seven conditions, then we would have this intersection. It's going to have some positive component, dimen positive dimensional component. I mean, it's not, uh, but then it might also have some zero dimensional components. Um, you have to first rule out that all the QIs have a common plane. Um, so the intersection Q1 intersection Q2 is going to be a degree four curve. Um, and it's going to have I plus as one of the irreducible components. We well, can see that it can't really be equal to I plus other that would that's not going to work. Um, so then you have to consider what are the possible decompositions of a degree four curve like that intersection of two quadrants into different pieces. Uh, there's a whole list of possibilities. Um, and we can see basically either it's going to be contained in some way in a union of two planes, or it's going to be have a rational normal normal cubic curve. Okay. So one of the cases is where C is equal to a rational normal cubic curve plus a line. Uh, the line has to hit it, has to be secant, has to hit it in two points. Now, if I plus was equal to L, then uh, you get some, you have some cases and so on. Well, I'm not going to just you can look at the slides on the on the website, I guess. There's some cases uh, you can show that that's not going to happen, basically. Uh, well, in fact, what you can show is that you can reach to the case where, where the P is contained in two planes, basically, in that case. Um, on the other hand, if, if I plus was the rational normal cubic, well, then as we move the, the choice of this two dimensional subspace Q1, Q2, then this the extra piece L is going to move. and well, roughly speaking, you can conclude from that that the whole subscheme P has to be contained in the rational normal cubic curve. So we basically reduce to two different cases. Either P is contained in the union of two planes, or it's contained in a rational normal cubic curve. And then you do a dimension count on those possibilities. Uh, and you see that the, the, when you do these dimension counts, you also have to be careful. You're not really counting the dimension. You're counting 
the dimension of the space of bundles in the moduli space that could correspond to that possibility. Because right? you have things like you have to choose the extension class and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, you do a dimension count of the possible places in the moduli space which could correspond to one of those cases. And you should see that it's less strictly less than 16. Well, the expected dimension is 16. So that thing can't, can't contribute a, a new irreducible component. That's just a brief rundown of the, uh, of the that's a that's kind of brief, brief overview of the type of argument that shows into that. You know, it's pretty long. Anyway, so let me finish now uh, for, for today. All right. Uh, if you can uh, unmute so you can uh, applaud for Carlos. Uh, any questions? So Carlos, do you know anything about the topology of the locus of zero dimensional schemes in the Hilbert scheme that satisfy K. Libahara? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, okay, what you can say is that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's not really even an open or a closed sub variety or something like that. I mean, uh, but what, I mean, it's kind of roughly speaking, looks like a closed sub variety in the sense that if you take something that satisfies Kaylee Bacharach and deform it, if you deform it keeping the same postulation, in other words, keeping the same number of conditions that it poses, imposes on like O of two, so like CB2. Um, if, you deform, if you deform it keeping that same number of conditions, then, then it's still gonna satisfy Kaylee Bacharach. You know what I'm saying? So and Kaylee Bacharach gets kind of an open condition and kind of a closed condition. There's a closed condition saying that the dimension of the space of sections of our, bun, of our line bundle that passes through that, that collection of points is at least such and such. And then there's an open condition saying that um, that you know, re removing one of the points doesn't modify that, basically, right? Right. Yeah. And you have, you have the dimension of the space of sections, and then you have the dimension of the space of sections when you remove one point, right? And those are both semi-continuous, right? So, but you're sort of comparing those two. So it's like a locally code thing. So it's not even really easy to understand what the you know how to describe that that locus, uh, basically. Um, so you know the, the the brief answer is definitely not. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know I, I don't even know how to say what it's going to look like. Um, but you know I think but you know for example for the case of Kaylee Ockhead you could say it's just an you know any generic plane uh, uh, three dimensional subspace of that ten dimensional space uh, a general three dimensional subspace of the ten ten dimensional space of quadrix that's going to define a Kaylee Ockhead right. Uh, So in that, you know, then what what are what are the ones which don't which aren't good? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I I have a somehow naive question. So, uh, can you go to the discussion where you like you take a section of this? Uh, Bundle, then take the co kernel, like the, like yeah. you take this O with the minus N. Uh, here. Yeah, yeah. So, so I wonder, uh, like, how uh, can you somehow generalize this? Like, say you have this E is of higher rank and you have many sections. Then, uh, like, what condition on E or on these sections uh, do you impose that such that you can guarantee the co kernel is torsion free? Um, yeah, that's a good point. So, I guess uh, I think if you chose R minus one sections, right, you're going to get. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Say, say that you, you, you have a rank one co kernel. Yeah, so if you have a right, so um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, um, but that's a good question. But it seems kind of likely that, but I, I mean, I would guess I would sort of suggest Google scholaring this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it seems likely that somebody probably has a theorem on that. Uh, I don't know the reference. Um, 
there is a discussion in Heubrex where I think you look at O going to E and then a direct sum of various ideal sheaves. Um, and then the other direction. That, so, so this is used to construct, I think, higher rank bundles with high values of C2. Um, wow, just to okay. just to see the bundle or just to see that bundles with given invariants exist at all. Um, yeah. So people definitely have considered kinds the kinds of things like this, but um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's true that you would tend to, to want to take R minus one sections and look at the look at the co-kernel sheaf. Um, Or even a rank R minus one sub bundle, possibly. I mean, there's there's lots of lots of different things that are yeah, yeah, yeah. potentially interesting here. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be all that surprised if it if it was just a pretty similar set of conditions, really. Uh, but you know, maybe, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. You know, may, maybe the bundle would, could sort of become non-locally free for. Kind of in any one of the directions, but yeah, yeah, maybe it would be good to see, say what you said about taking a, a rank R minus one sub bundle. That might be more. I think when you take a bunch of ideal sheaves, I think that I think the classical Cayley Wagner condition still just goes through. Basically, I think if they if they each independently satisfy Cayley Wagner, then then things work out. But I I um, yeah, look look in look in chapter. Oh. Um, Marcos has a has a reference suggestion. Oh, thanks. Oh. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. <laughs> Okay, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, is there anything you can say about the Kodaira dimension of this uh, moduli space for small C2? Uh, well, okay. Uh, well, maybe, uh, I guess you guys all have the notes anyway, but uh, to uh, spoiler alert, right? Uh, the case, uh, um, for C2 equals four, it's, it's equal to X, and for C2 equals five, it's equal to P3. So that's pretty much says that you're not going to have a general statement in there, right? <laughs> um, so, so for, for C4 equals X, it's a general type, it's equal to X. For C, sorry, C2 equals four, it's equal to X, it's general type. C2 equals five, it's equal to P3. And yeah, it's an open subset of P3. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, roughly speaking, yeah, I guess not really. Um, I, I think you should probably say, my, I mean, it's probably more better to ask that question in the in the case where C two becomes big, uh, yeah, yeah. Case, uh, I don't know the answer, but that probably is more. Uh, I mean, you know, there's probably. I, I mean, I'm sure you guys must know this much more better than I do. There's probably some kind of way of relating that those spaces to Hilbert scheme too, in some way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. I see. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, it seems that there aren't any more questions. Um, so we are going to reconvene tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, for Carlos's third lecture. But in the meantime, uh, let's thank him again uh, for this wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for listening.